Hello everyone. Thank you for tuning in to another Lansing Journal weekly video. I'm Josh Bootsman, Managing Editor, and the Lansing Journal exists to build community by keeping people like yourself informed and connected. Today we're here again with Jeff White, local historian, Ileana <laughs> Christian High School teacher. Jeff, you joined us and walked us through some of the significance and history of the Lansing Veterans Memorial. Thank you for doing that. And thank you for joining us for another step into Lansing's history. And that was fun, and it was a downpour that afternoon. <laughs> yes. But here we are on the hottest day right. of the entire year. Right. And this is what we do for those Lansing view or readers right. of the of the Lansing Journal. Absolutely. You know, we, we sacrifice. We're gonna try not to sweat so. too much and get too many mosquito bites while exactly. we're out here. But thank you for being here. We're at Oak Glen Lutheran Cemetery today. And I know what you're thinking. You're a newspaper. The cemetery is about the last place where breaking news happens. And I agree with you, you're correct. But local cemeteries have a very deep connection and rich history to the towns that they're found in. And Jeff is gonna walk us through some of the significance of Oak Glen Lutheran Cemetery today. And there's just a, some broad strokes we're gonna talk about. There's probably a lot of you that when you see maybe this on Facebook, you'll, you'll offer a comment or two. We can't cover everything, but yes, you are right. Cemeteries do speak volumes about the people that founded or lived in a community. Mm -hmm. And when we think about Lansing, Lansing really started by two types of immigrant communities, mm -hmm. the, Dutch, the Dutch community as well as the German community. And these two different ethnic communities also, we're not gonna try to label them all into one box, but a lot of the, of the Germans were Lutherans mm -hmm. and a lot of the Dutch uh, immigrants, they were from the reform perspective. Mm. So during the day and during the week, they lived alongside each other, they bumped elbows with each other, they worked with each other. But when it came to worship on Sunday, well, things were a little separate in Lansing on Sunday. Yeah. And especially when you died, things were separate when you died <laughs> because here is Oakland Cemetery and then just about 300 yards to the west of us is Oak Ridge Cemetery where a lot of the Dutch immigrants and some of the Dutch uh, families were, were buried. <laughs> and of course, Lansing's going to change over time. After World War II, we're gonna see a larger influx of Eastern European immigrants, <laughs> a lot of uh, Polish, especially Polish Catholic uh, immigrants coming into town. And then as we go through the 1970s, 80s, the town becomes more diverse and there's a lot of different um, inclusiveness that takes place in our town over those decades. So, oh, and like I said, we're not gonna necessarily cover everything, but let's take a look at some of the interesting things on how to read a cemetery. So let's start at the south end. All right. Let's take a walk. Let's go. So in this part of the cemetery, and it's not uncommon, especially if we go back maybe 60, 70 years, when a young child would die, many, many husbands and wives as they get older, they buy a cemetery plot for them and their spouse. Mm -hmm. But you oftentimes don't think of a child right. passing away. Right. And so in this part of Oakland Cemetery, we have what's called the children's portion of the cemetery. So you can see a lot of these small infants only lived a few days. Right. And what is oftentimes indicative of a child's gravesite is the inscriptions. Quite often the inscriptions might have a small cherub on it, but also they might have like a lamb on the top. And you can see over time a lot of these stones have really, really started to, to fade. Hmm. But, uh, but Lansing is not different than any other municipality or any other village around the country where you're gonna see oftentimes in a corner of a cemetery, a child's, you know, a child's area. Wow, interesting. Yeah. But what's really <laughs> neat about this cemetery is the, is the landscape. We know that Lansing, and Ridge Road used to be the ridge of Lake Michigan 600 years ago. Mm. In fact, there were three really, really well-defined ridge lines. Ridge Road, and if we go a little bit further to the south, the Glenwood Dune, what they called the Glenwood Dune. So when you go to Linwood Roller Rink when you were kids, you were starting to go up, you know, up mm. a little bit, rise in elevation. And when you're up there on Glenwood Dyer Road, especially during the winter time, you can see for, for quite some distance because you're at another level of the old Lake Michigan Ridge Line. And then if we go a little bit further to the south of that, we come across Sauk Trail, which, you know, 
few thousand years ago used to be the edge of Lake Michigan. Hmm. But when we look through the cemetery right now, and, and uh, you can certainly see the contour of the old dunes hmm. the way they were 200 years ago, where a lot of areas of our town, especially if we go a little bit east of here, and we go over to Escanaba Street or Oakley Street, you know, you still see that, that drop in elevation as you go from the old ridge of Lake Michigan into the lake bottom. But here is where you truly see the dune landscape, yeah. which I think is, is kind of amazing for this area of the, uh, of the cemetery. All right, so we're in front of a grave here. Who do we have here? Patricia Ray. I, I know nothing about this young woman. What I do know is that when I would take my students in here, and we would do, like I said, we do a few cemetery walks throughout the course of my local history class, um, I always like to bring them over here to Patricia Ray because she's 18 years old. Hmm. And it, it brings perspective to my students when they see a grave site of somebody their own age. Yeah. Now what makes that unique, especially here in a Lutheran cemetery, is the picture that you see of her. Mm -hmm. And yeah, she was, she was buried in 1959. Uh, you know, we're talking over, over uh, 60 years ago, and yet that picture still is pretty much intact. Yeah. But this is what you will see quite often out of an Eastern European or an Orthodox type of, of, of individual, Interesting. which is unique for a more generally Lutheran cemetery. Hmm. So, Patricia Ray, would you like to go to another spot? Yes, let's, let's go to another spot. very interesting. So as we come to the top of the dune, or the, top, the highest point here in the cemetery, this is where some of the oldest stones have been placed, hmm. where you have a lot of uh, people who were born, especially in Germany, and then pass away in their new home country of the United States. So in death, they're going to hold on to a lot of that rich connection to their, to their heritage and to their language. So even in, in the inscriptions here, these biblical inscriptions, you're gonna see that they're in German. So German, yeah. here is the Peters family. And there were a lot of different uh, German families that were quite prominent here in Lansing at the time, from the Peters, the Schultz, the <laughs> the Langs, the Lorenz, hmm. and a lot of those, a lot of those families are still here in town, and a lot of streets in town are yeah. named after those families, indeed. So, you said that some of the oldest are here in the middle of the mm -hmm. cemetery. To your knowledge, is that common practice that when someone starts a cemetery, <laughs> way back when you found a town, you start burying people in the middle, and you kind of make your way out, or is that common? I I, I can't make a claim to that, okay. other than the fact that if we look over here you see some of the larger monuments yeah, and right. memorials are at the highest point in the cemetery, sure. actually giving them um, a more established look. Right. And so they're gonna be seen from a long, a long ways away. Right. And so here is, you know, a very, very well established, beautiful uh, memorial that's still, still very well intact, where if we look just a little bit downhill, um, regrettably, some of these stones are very forgotten, hmm. and uh, and the inscriptions have worn off over the years because it was more of a, a slate or a stone material versus a granite material. As we look at a stone like this, the inscriptions have been totally weathered away. We don't even yeah. know who this person is anymore. And I know that, I know this sounds kind of strange, but at Halloween, if somebody's going to somehow decorate their home, they're sometimes going to make the headstone look in this, this right. kind of design. Right. What's interesting is this kind of headstone, especially in the late 1800s, you would have uh, some troubled individuals who would actually go into the, into the cemeteries and steal these and sell them, believe it or not, to bakers. Really? Because if a baker had a, had a brick oven, the bottom of the brick oven would have bricks and they would sag and they would have to be readjusted. And if you are actually baking something, it might come a little bit out of level. Sure. But if you had a tombstone as the bottom of your brick oven, that's a whole lot better baking material, holds the heat. Wow. And yeah, so it's not uncommon to find a stolen headstone in a baker's oven.
Interesting. Yeah. In fact, I can recall in the grocery aisle, you might see a brand of frozen pizza <laughs> called Tombstone. Uh, maybe there's a connection. There is one. Who knows? I've, it, <laughs> I've eaten one. <laughs> Who knows if that's the connection? Interesting. So as we continued our walk and we went further and further north through the cemetery, and now we're up here on Thornton Lansing Road, we go past other families that are very, very, have a lot of deep roots here at, in, in Lansing, Bergman's, we pass the Crum families, and now we're here towards the north end, and it's oftentimes the, you know, the, uh, the Schultz area of the cemetery, where mm. there's a lot of different Schultz who are buried here on the north end. But what I find interesting is this kind of hidden little uh, stair step over here. Oh, sure. And if we just throw a few little twigs out of the way, we see these steps going down more towards street level. Yeah. These steps are the old steps going into Trinity Lutheran Church, which was wow. on this area right here. Wow. And now, of course, Trinity has a beautiful building about 300 yards to the east of us. But yet, the old church was on this, this spot right here. If we go into the rural areas of Indiana or Illinois, you're often going to see a church with its own cemetery plot. Yeah. That goes back to a lot of these traditions that come out of the Reformation, hmm. where you have the church worshiping, the people worshiping inside the church, who are what's called, called the church militant. They're fighting sin, they're fighting Satan, they're fighting evil in this life. And then you look outside into the cemetery and you see what's known as the church triumphant, hmm. those people who have passed on into eternal glory. Hmm. So there's that connection of, of the families of God being in the church and also being in the cemetery. And who knows, maybe next year we'll go and do a feature story of First PCA's um, cemetery. Uh, Marlene Cook has wrote a wonderful book about that and yes. there's a lot of interesting anecdotes and uh, people who have some unique stories that are part of that cemetery. Interesting. The reason why I wanted to stop over here is because there are some remnants still in the cemetery of outlined either with some kind of stone feature or some kind of edging yeah. where a family might have their own family plot and there might be 15, 16 people buried within that family, okay. uh, sometimes multiple, multiple layers. But this is the Noss family plot. And I find this interesting because what you have here is you've got a reflecting bench, hmm. you know, for somebody to come here to think about their, their past loved ones. But if you take a look at the bench, the bench reflects the old tree right here. Yes, it does. And that's yeah. oftentimes when we think about landscape architecture or even in regular architecture, if we think of something known as contextualization, you take something from the surrounding elements and you bring it to a, a focal point. So this must be a very old tree. Very old tree, yeah. Beautiful old tree. Very beautiful. Right. Yes. This is, like, it strikes me, I think, going, again, going back to modern conceptions of, of cemeteries, that is a very, you know, morbid place. But this is... This is a beautiful place. It is this, a beautiful place. You're talking about, you can see how the history of the sand dunes. We've got, we're just a few hours from sunset. It's right. a, it is a beautiful place here right now in Lansing. Without a doubt. And so many of us, when we think about cemeteries or visiting a cemetery, it's going to be Arlington Cemetery in D.C., sure. you right. know, beautifully primed and, and laid out, or maybe going to Gettysburg Cemetery because hmm. of the history that lay behind that cemetery, or even down in Springfield. Um, to go visit Lincoln's tomb. Those are the three most visited cemeteries uh, in our country. Mm -hmm. But here we have the you know this beautiful picturesque cemetery right here in the in the middle of Lansing. Yeah, and that that I think someone maybe who's new to town. I I haven't lived in Lansing for too long myself. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of why should someone visit the cemetery if I don't have a loved one buried here? Well, what's the significance of visiting the cemetery in your local town? I, the, 
each to his own, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> from the beauty, the, the serenity, the quiet. But also, if you want to know a little bit about a town, you can see the different names. And like we said earlier in our, our walk through the cemetery today, how many of these names actually end up on street posts? Hmm. where streets are named after them. Now when I take my students in here, I'm going to try to tie in uh, a Christian world and life view because what I want my students to do is to see headstones, regrettably, of people that have been forgotten. Hmm. And our time here on, on earth is very short and when these people left this, this earth, they wanted certain Bible verses, certain mottos or certain different reflections placed on their tombstone. And so when I've taken my students in here, they oftentimes have a worksheet to fill out. And one of the questions at the bottom is, what would your epitaph say? Hmm. Um, what do you want? To, if you could summarize a thesis statement about you, Josh, hmm. what would that statement say? Yeah. What do you want to go on to you know, eternity having people know about you? And that's what I find really unique as we go into the last part of our, kind of our little walking tour today. So Let's why don't do we that. head back south? Great. What we want to kind of have as our capstone is the fact that when we look around the cemetery, there's a lot of American flags. Yeah. And I think that our veterans groups in town do a great job, especially when it comes to Memorial Day or Veterans Day, yeah. making sure that those veterans are not forgotten. Yeah. And if you think about this too, we see some of these veterans here, ones who weren't killed in war, uh, but died after the war was over, yet what do they want to have on their tombstone? They might have lived a, a 70 or 80 year old life. Right. They've worked in factories, they raised families, but what did they want on their tombstone? What they wanted on their tombstone was their service for their country and what that meant to them. At this small block of time when they were 18 to 21, hmm. that was a defining period for them. So you see here, George Anderson, Army, Private, World War II. Yeah. Um, this is what these people wanted, wanted to be remembered for. The greatest generation said, hey, we went and we stopped this tyranny that was taking place. I would encourage you, if you haven't read some of Marlene Cook's articles on Lansing's history, there's a lot of context that I think, I, I recognize names in this place mm -hmm. because I have read some of Marlene's work which has been published by the Lansing Journal. So re reference some of that. Any other place people can go to help contextualize what's here in this place? Oh, you know, our, our town has a lot of different little nuggets that are interesting to explore. And I'm gonna say, we gotta save that question for maybe two months from now when we do another little history walk right. <laughs> and uh, look at some other different uh, signature spaces in our town. I think, Jeff, you might be our first regular on uh, this not? little show, this video <laughs> that we not? have every week. Excellent, well, thank you so much thanks. for walking us through. Hey, thanks, brother. Hottest day of the year. Hottest day of the year. It was really good to uh, Come to go to Culver's and get some, get some ice cream. <laughs> there you go. Good to connect to Lansing's history a little bit for someone right. who's very knowledgeable about it like yourself. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you.